Alrighty, folks, uh, picking up where we left off the other day, we only had a couple more slides with the topic that we were on, but um, you guys were glazed over, and I think we were close to our time anyhow, so um, we're going to tack on a couple slides today, and it, it was kind of some heavy stuff as well, so I think that was part of the other reason I, I stopped, but and then we're going to change gears and talk about a related but different topic. So, anywho. Uh, so we were talking about rocks and time and the idea that rock layers uh, took time to put down, therefore they represent time. Let alone the amount of time that occurred for them to be excavated, for lack of a better word. All right, for to be worn back down uh, a valley, whatever, for whatever reason you're actually seeing it, that took time as well. So not just the idea that, that, that rocks equal time, but you got to kind of back up and look at the, the bigger picture, all right? And um, when you do that, then we can start to think about reconstructing history, so to speak, reconstructing the environments. Um, you may have heard of a paleontologist, right? A uh, paleontologist, ontos is beings or organisms, so paleontologist studies uh, old things, old critters. Uh, there is a paleo-environment, paleo-environmentologist, that doesn't sound right either, um, uh, but a person who studies reconstructing um, the environments. All right, and um, they, they work close in hand, of, as I'm sure you could imagine, uh, because an environment is not just, uh, you know, plants and sediments and stuff. It's also the critters that live in it. gives you some great tips uh, as to where you're, you're headed. So um, when you see stuff like this, um, they can picture a little more than just rocks. All right. So you remember your rock types, of course. If not, oh, there is a handy dandy little key this time. So you remember that the little bricks are limestone, the little dashed lines are shales, and the dots are sandstone. So what we see here is a, uh, a sequence, is what we call it, all right, of limestone on the bottom, uh, then shale, and then sandstone. Now, uh, applying some of the stuff we learned the other day, uh, which of these rock layers was more than likely, again, you've got to check a few things, but more than likely, which rock layer was laid down first? The bottom one, the limestone. Great. And then what? The shale and then the sandstone. Okay. So more than likely, the limestone was being the first thing deposited, then shale and then sandstone so we've got that part in order okay then we go back and we remember that limestone is a marine deposit all right and not just a marine deposit but kind of decently offshore then we remember that shale shales muds shale is usually close to shore all right and then we remember that sand well, sand is beach, sand is shore. So we see deep water, shallower water, shore. Now, that's a good chunk of it, but we gotta take one more thing into account. And that's that these rocks, again, probably haven't moved. So say you're standing there, if you could picture driving down the throughway, riding down the throughway, and for whatever reason, um, you pull over and you stop at one of those outcrops where all the shale is, a little bit of limestone standing there. So you're standing there right there on that spot or up in the Adirondacks, wherever you've been, anywhere there's a, a, a cliff face of rock you could picture. All right. Now you got to imagine yourself standing there the entire time that was being built. You don't have to go into too much detail, just again. You were there the entire time, all right? Because those rocks haven't moved. So at some point where you're standing, 
that limestone was being formed, which meant you were in fairly deep ocean water. Then, sometime later, we don't know any numbers, okay, but sometime later, you were standing in significantly shallower water because shale was being deposited. And then sometime later, still, you haven't moved. Where you're currently standing was a beach full of sand. So, with that in place, what has happened to sea level from the perspective of where you're standing? Has it stayed the same? Has it stayed? You got an answer. Hold on. Has it stayed the same? No. Right? We went through three different rock types, which I told you represent three different environments. Has sea level risen or has sea level gone back, receded? Receded, receded. Now, is that what you said a moment or two ago? Good. How do they know that? All right. Well, you're, where you're standing gets increasingly shallower and shallower deposits. All right. If you saw this in reverse, if you saw sand on the bottom, shale on in the middle, and limestone on the top, what would you guess? Sea level went up. All right. So again, not to get political. We see this over and over and over again. The idea that sea level doesn't change is absolutely freaking ridiculous. Of course it changes. It has always changed, and it will always continue to change. All right? The hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, it's a closed system. And yeah, there's aquifers. Yeah, there's weather. But the best way, the easiest way, to store water and to change sea level is ice and glaciers, okay? During the ice ages, right? All these glaciers are on land. Sea level was significantly lower. We see that because, well, we can see river valleys going way, 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 way farther out. All right, they're now flooded, inundated. You're sitting there watching National Geographic or Discovery Channel and there's somewhere in the Mediterranean looking at these drowned villages, right? Do you think they built those things underwater? Of course not, all right? They're old enough that they were closest, closer to the last ice age in time. Sea level hadn't completely recovered yet. They're still melting from various places in the world. So we know this happens. We have it in the rock records. We see it in our archaeological records as well, if you want to talk about the villages. And again, what they're really arguing about is, you know, just like a couple brothers and sisters fighting. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. That's what they're really arguing about. They have to say, no, sea level isn't changing, da 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 But what they really mean is that my constituents and, and my, my, my corporate backing is, is not responsible for this. That's the political end. But they don't go straight there. They can't, I guess. I don't, I don't do politics well. I don't know. But when they stand up there and argue that it's just not happening, it's absurd. So this is just one. This is the simplest sequence, okay? Um, and there, there, there's many, many, many sequences out there. You could, you could read it you could um, and, and, and interpret. And again, it is interpreting. You've got to look at other things. All right, we're really Sesame Streeting this here, just saying it's you know very straightforward. Because there are other places. What's a non-aquatic uh, way to get sand? Where else do you see huge amounts of sand that are nowhere near the beach? Deserts, yeah. All right. It could be desert sand. Probably not coming after limestone, but you, you never know, you know. Um, but desert sand does tend to have, as you'll see in a, in a little bit, some unique features. And, and like I said, there's there's always something you could look at. So now I might ask you something like this on the test, so I really want to make sure you guys get what's going on. All right, you have to remember that certain rocks are a function of certain environments or are created by certain environments. And that certain re environments are sort of related, connected. I think we talked uh, offhandedly the other day about a 
uh, a marsh or a swamp drying up, and maybe we even started with a lake. A lake starts to dry up and it turns into a marsh. That marsh continues to dry up, it turns into a field, or vice versa. Okay. So we see it happening at the surface all around us, kind of applying uniformitarianism from the other day, right? We see it happening at the surface, we could assume that it happened in the past. So, neat stuff, and I will not belabor this, I promise. We have words for those, unfortunately, vocabulary words, sorry. Transgression and regression. Which one do you think is the ocean moving back? Regression, okay? So transgression is when sea level rises, Regression is when sea level lowers. I always got to muck it up with vocabulary words. Here's sort of a doodle. I think I tried to make this myself and then I just gave up and borrowed somebody's. But it is cited at the bottom there. So again, we have our sand, then the shale, then the limestone. And you're like, wait a minute, we just, we looked at this vertically. Of course, this is one layer. If you were to go back to this and you walked down the road, up the road, you got to figure out what's going on. You walk the right way, you should see, horizontally speaking, the shale and then further down the sandstone. All in this layer. So, so this and this are related. That first one we showed is this, but stacked. So sea level rises. This guy moves over one hop. See, I'm moving my mouse here. This guy moves over a notch. This guy moves over a notch. And this guy moves over a notch. Okay? Or sea level goes out. This one moves over a notch. This one moves over a notch. That one moves over a notch. And it eventually stacks up to give you the cliffs that you guys see. It's actually really easier to see the, the vertical all right, then it is to see the horizontal, but, all right. Okay, so enough of that kind of cool, but maybe kind of confusing stuff for you, making you think this early in the morning. I do apologize. Uh, this stuff's a lot more straightforward, but still amazingly helpful. Uh, sedimentary structures. It should have more of a title page than, than this, because like I said, we really are sort of switching gears here. Uh, sedimentary structures are features found within sedimentary rocks. They form after deposition, but before lithification. So deposition is putting the sediment down, of course. Lithification is when it turns into a rock. All right. And um, this goes back to, again, that with sedimentary rocks, um, typically you're at the surface, whether it's the surface out here where we can walk around as people, or you're, you're deep underwater, that's still considered the surface of the earth. Life is going on, on it, around it, and in it. And quite frequently, well, not quite frequently, often, it leaves some record. And that's what sedimentary structures are. If you go through them, you'll, you'll see where we're going with this. All right, here's our first one. And again, we know the screen's a little small here. Uh, let me try and hit the zoomy thing. Make it a little more clear. Where 
I'm going to get rid of the words just for a minute. So what are we looking at there? A footprint. You said a what? A dinosaur footprint. Awfully assumptive of you, but maybe. A uh, prism. A footprint. Okay. Well, let's pretend that you guys uh, were 100 years ago now. You don't have access to all the knowledge that you have, let alone in the palm of your hand in a fraction of a second, as long as you've got good signal and you don't have 250,000 hits to sort through, and, and, and most of them say that, and some of you are trying to sell you ointments and creams and, and everything else. Um, what else could that possibly be? Erosion. It could be erosion. It could have a totally inorganic um, source. That's very true. But I'm thinking of another like organic source. What else could it have been? Huh? A plant. It could be well, but part of a plant. A leaf. All right. So. It is definitely leaf shape. How could we eliminate the idea that it, 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 it was a leaf, though? Because the leaf actually with all these kind of trail images and stuff that you can show me like the original. Okay, well, you, you, I show you guys some real, that's good. He says, because it looks, you know, it, it, you can see the veins in the leaf and so on and so forth. Um, we got some really good fossils, though, in, the, in our show. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's the big one right there. That'd be a really heavy freaking leaf, wouldn't it? Um, that's the biggest thing that would tell us that it's not a leaf. All right. And, and I know you guys are like, well, we knew what it was five minutes ago. Why are you doing this? Well, I'm doing this because you can't assume that you're always going to know what you're looking at. All right. So we want to talk briefly about how you can eliminate what it was. Um, so yeah, if it was a leaf, Okay, that'd be a really weird leaf we've never really seen because they're just not that thick and heavy. Um, it does look like a footprint. I totally agree. You could potentially even see claw marks, all right, where the claws came off the foot. And if you've got a really keen eye, you could see an imprint of um, one of the last, last paw pads there or its heel. Uh, you see a bit of a heel mark in the back. Okay. So... This is an example, regardless of what it is at the moment, this is an example of what we call a trace fossil or an ichno fossil. All right? It is not the dinosaur. It is not the leaf. It's evidence that it was there at some point in the past. And yes, tracks are a huge uh, source of trace fossils. All right? There may be just this one. You might have a whole pathway of these guys. Either way, you're, um, you, you got some information. Yes, more than likely this is a dinosaur. Um, there were, at least transient-wise, some dinosaurs in the very eastern New York, uh, Connecticut River area. So up into Connecticut and down into uh, New York. Um, we have zero bones. Zero bones so far that, that I'm aware of. But we do have a handful of these tracks. They don't know what critter it belongs to. They got a couple ideas, Coelophysis, if you know who that is. Um, but they named the, tra the tracks. I'm going to say you bronchies, and I'm not sure that that's actually right. Um, but they named the tracks. Okay, it's not the name of the dinosaur, but it's the name of the track sequences. And um, wherever they see then that same set of tracks, they'll say, oh, that is a, an example of blah, 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 blah. Um, now i got to look and make sure. Because I don't want to give you the wrong name. I think it's you bronchies. Something with a U in it. E-U-B-R-O-N-G-E-S. Eurobytes? No, I'm not misspelling Eurobytes. Oh, I forgot the N. Or more so, I typed the B. 
Brontes. Yep, I was right. Hugh Brontes. E U B R O N T E S. Um, and like I said, they think it was Coelophysis, roughly a ostrich-sized guy that was running around here. Um, they're in stream deposits, which again, uh, if they did die there, streams are horrible places to become fossils. Really high energy, wash your bones away. Uh, especially if you were one of those bird-like dinosaurs, uh, your bones may have been hollow. Uh, they just smashed and bashed into little pieces parts. Okay. Um, so again, no, no actual fossils of dinosaurs, but we do have some uh, footprints that they at least walked through the area. And like I said, trace fossils come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, burrows are another thing that we can find. Um, when I went out west to uh, Nebraska, University of Nebraska, to get my horse toes, um, they had a whole wall bigger than this, well, it was about the size of this wall, but higher, where uh, out in the plains, there must have been a huge flood, flash flood kind of thing, and uh, prairie dogs out there, right? So this huge prairie dog um, complex was just flooded with, it was in... Uh, probably what turned into sandstone. So it was flooded with mud. So you get this real fine grained mudstone or siltstone sort of going, look like Pac-Man, right? Except there are these poor little prairie dog skeletons in the middle every so often. Um, but it was, it was very cool looking, okay? So that was evidence that, you know, prairie dogs were in the area. It happened to be stacked with actual fossils too, but. So trace fossils. Not the critter itself, but evidence that the critter was in the area. If this were to be preserved in the rock record, what might geologists in the future think? That, well, what is this, by the way? It has a tire track, right? All right, and it's the exact same idea. Now, in order for this to be preserved, what has to happen? You've got to have another layer of mud get thrown on this really, really quick before somebody, you know, steps on it, does something else, drives over it, ruins it in some way, shape, or form. All right, so again, you see how it's kind of hard to to become a fossil, um, let alone a trace fossil. All right, it's even hard to be a trace fossil. Because this just dries out and weathering and erosion goes on, you know, flush it. There's no... Uh, It'll be erased. All right, this is one of my favorites because it um, it reminds me of a really funny time at a uh, at a conference, and those don't happen a lot. Um, if you're walking along the beach and you pick up a seashell or two, uh, you quite likely have found uh, one with a perfect little round hole in the back. And you might have liked it because you're like, oh, cool, I can hang this on a necklace real easily, so on and so forth. Or you just thought it was neat, or you didn't pay any attention to it whatsoever. But usually if you're out there walking around looking for seashells, you would think that that was cool. So I'm at a conference, oh, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, I walk by, I'm looking around for something that's exciting to go see, so, you know, something that's at least not horribly boring. And the sign out front of the door says, Predatory Snails of the Cretaceous. I'm like, Predatory Snails? Uh, okay. You don't really think of snails when you think of predators, really. You know, you cheetahs and jaguars and tigers and stuff like that. But, but snails, not so much. So it turns out that one of the only things that's slower than a snail is a clam. Clams don't go very fast. They can move. So that's what they predate. They predator on. Um, snails are vicious things. If you have a fish tank, it might be worth getting a snail for a little while just to watch them. They're, they're very cool little critters. Um, they have what's called a rasper on their mouth. And it's a calcitic plate that's got little teeth on it. And uh, if you've ever seen anyone drill a uh, doorknob hole 
or you can at least imagine the drill bit that would have to drill a doorknob hole. It's very similar. So this thing, instead of going because you've got, you know, like a craftsman or something in your hand, it goes back and forth, kind of ratchety motion. Very, very patient. Clam isn't going anywhere. Snail's got all day. And slowly but surely, they drill through the shell and slurp out the yummies on the inside once they're done. So that, my friends, if this were a fossilized shell, this is a fresh shell though, uh, that would be an example of a trace fossil as well. So you could stack these. This would be a fossil of a seashell, but then we have evidence that there were snails in the area, and not just any kind of snail, but a carnivorous snail. So, um, anywho, so just kind of neat the way that you can stack that, and again, this is actually fairly common. If you fish, and you, um, in some of the, the, the Great Lakes, I think they've worked their way down to the, to the smaller lakes around here, uh, you might pull, pull up a fish that has a bunch of little round sores on it. And that's not due to um, snails, that's due to lampreys. All right, uh, you may not ever see or catch a lamprey, they're pretty nasty things you don't want to see one anyhow. Um, but you could certainly infer that there are lampreys in the area. So, again, not fossilized, but an example of what we're talking about in general. Uh, I, I'm not going to use your time right now to show you this, but this is a snail. Do you want to see a snail attacking a uh, cockle shell? I, I don't have one of a snail eating a sea cucumber, unfortunately. Oh, I meant like an actual cucumber. Oh. No, there are videos out there. Of snails eating cucumbers? Adorable. Okay. I've seen cats being as scared of cucumbers. I'm not sure that's real, but I've not seen a snail eating a cucumber. We lived Fremont, Ohio. Briefly. Word of advice. When you're picking a, uh, you're moving to a new town for a job or something like that, don't necessarily just look at a map and pick somewhere close. I was teaching at three different schools at one point, so I picked the town because it was in the middle. And yeah, that was weird. This is before you could do stuff on the internet so easily. But at any rate, every time we'd wake up in the morning, we saw all these crystally little tracks all over the, the sidewalks and the sides of the houses and everything. We're like, what is this weird spark? It's like if a whole bunch of fairies went out with, with glitter glue and um, just didn't know what it was. And then one night we came home kind of late and we're walking from the car to the to the side door, and you could just tell you were stepping on something nasty. We didn't know what was going on, and uh, so we looked out, and there were dozens they're called banana slugs, dozens of these yellow and black striped, good two and a half three inches long, everywhere. So yeah, I'm not going to go watch a video of a snail eating a cucumber and kind of weird it out by snails. But uh, slugs in particular. Snails are alright, but but slugs, Jesus. Um, alright, well I will provide you guys with this direct link uh, should you want to watch it. I think I heard one or two other no's. Um, it's actually rather fascinating. Uh, if you, you know, it's a very stereotypical view you have of snails, let me tell you that. They are, they are, uh, quite, quite uh, efficient little critters. All right, so enough with trace fossil. Let's talk about actual fossils. What is this an actual fossil of? A fish, exactly. Now again, there may be a point in time where you would not know what this was. You could have grown up uh, in the middle of a continent, nowhere near uh, a stream or a lake somehow, um, unlikely because you need water, but there, there could be a person out there that didn't know this was a fish and you would slowly but surely have to fit this into your little worldview and figure out what it was, but for us it's quite simple. And, and not only is it a fish, it's a really well-preserved uh, fish. Um, you could see just about in the middle of it there, you could even see one of its uh, uh, side fins, okay? And as you start to look over, you can see where the eye and the lips are. 
uh, or were. Um, this was really well preserved. And even that tells us something about the environment. Um, because, yeah, usually when you see a fish fossil, it's going to have a, you know, a huge bite out of it. Or uh, at least, you know, the, the finer edges of the fins are going to be gone. Not to mention the lips and the eyes. Those are the yummy bits. Okay, that's going to go first. Um, whether you're predating with actual critters or you're decaying with bacteria. Those soft, fleshy bits just, just go away. Um, so this sucker was preserved super quick. All right. Now, is it fresh water, salt water? You got to look for other clues. This looks like it's sandstone. Not necessarily decisive, but um, you look around for some more and more and more ideas, um, and eventually you'll be able to piece together, you know, what it was. Now, this is not a historical geology class, so we're not going to go into uh, talking about all the different ways that fossils can be preserved. You may or may not remember from either growing up as a child and enjoying fossils for a brief period of your life, uh, or maybe in your earth science class in high school they talked about it a little bit. Um, but there are a number of ways that this stuff can be saved. So a fossil. So the difference between a trace fossil and a fossil is that this is either preserved or replaced actual organism. All right. You can either preserve it or you can sort of swap out the original stuff with minerals or some combination there. And this is a nice little imprint and impression. But there's a lot of the uh, carbon left over from the from the flesh. Like I said, this guy. This guy was sealed up in a Ziploc, essentially, a Tupperware, um, which is really great for us. If you uh, poked around enough, you probably could even tell what he had for lunch. But So, fossil is the actual organism, or bits and pieces of the actual organism. You, it's very rare to get this entire critter. Usually it's a piece, a couple pieces. All right. Um, and uh, they're not as plentiful as, as you think. Uh, arguably, what do you think is the most um, uh, famous dinosaur? Tyrannosaurus rex. Do you know how many we got? I think three. Three. Okay. The most famous out there. And we know, you know how many of them ever lived? Three jillion, right? And we got three. So we know very, very little about these things. I personally think, you know, you got Allosaurus, you got um, Albertosaurus, you got T Rex. They all look essentially like the same critter. I think even there we're just looking at um, locational differences, gender differences, uh, so on and so forth. We know very little about these things. So, and I think even our three T-Rexes aren't even 100% complete. So, most famous is Sue. You may have heard of Sue. She's at the uh, Field Museum in Chicago. That's the one that Yeah. Yeah, she's, uh, they, they made copies of her, understandably. But uh, they made a huge deal when they came, Sue came to the uh, Strong Museum a few years back. And Sue was on tour, so it was, it was a freaking copy. I was, so especially because they charge like 25 bucks to get in to see it too. Um, I expected to see the real Sioux. Uh, there's also one in the Chicago airport. I could again understand not putting the original one there. But um, but yeah, even those, they're missing you know, a toe or a rib here or there. Um, usually the bigger and the harder the bone, uh, the more likely you'll find it. The little guys obviously get lost, the thin pieces get broken. So on and so forth. So, so fossils. All right, now we're getting on to much more mundane things. Mud cracks. Believe it or not, mud cracks often get preserved in the rock record. And um, they look like that. 
So going back to our wild, naive guessing, you could perhaps start a hypothesis wherein you found a part of a giant turtle shell, right? Kind of looks like a turtle shell, maybe. I don't know. But we get mud cracks. So what does that tell us? Well, this is an environmental indicator, right? This is an area that's uh, probably not really vegetated too much. Why? Because it's probably wet a lot of times. Um, it is silts and clays. It is muddy stuff anyhow. And um, the cool thing about mud, you'll see this a lot. It was probably some of my tire track picture. Um, clay loves water. It's called hydrophilic. Uh, phobic is when you're afraid of something, right? Philic is when you love something. So hydrophilic, uh, it attracts water. So what happens is that um, uh, these, these clays swell up when they get wet. And as they dry out, they try to preserve their original stature, so to speak. They're, they're, they're swelled up um, versions of themselves. So what happens is you get this, uh, well, you get this. Um, if you could imagine being a teeny tiny little ant to be like walking through the Death Valley or something like that, these giant mesas all around you and everything. It's uh, kind of cool looking stuff, but it is just mud cracks and we quite frequently just tromp over it like it's nothing, right? Um, so again, in order for this to happen, and you can even see the different grain sizes in there a little bit, uh, for this to happen, that must have gotten buried over. We had another flood, maybe. We had a flood, and it threw a whole bunch of mud over those mud cracks, and it just kept progressing from, from there. Pocket knife for scale. Oh, there we go. You've seen that. So it happens by us even. I was lucky to catch two different sizes. Here. And I think there's even a bit of a tire track over here too. All right, next is cross bedding. So this example shows you cross bedding um, with water and without water. I want you to kind of ignore the bottom there. When I when when we use the word cross bedding. I want you to think of sand dunes, okay? Um, and ideally desert. Yes, there's dunes at the beach, um, but those are further back, and I, and I just don't even want to start to confuse you with stuff. So when we talk about cross bedding, we are talking about sand dunes, and as I said, I want you guys to think deserts. So. Sand dunes are constantly moving. If you've ever been in a really sandy area, you know that the sand can blow around. Um, the beach is not the best place to bring a brand new pair of sunglasses. Uh, even if you don't drop them in the sand, you'll come home the end of the week and you'll say, oh my God, these are so scratched up, what the heck happened? Sand is constantly blowing around. So dunes move first and foremost because of that. But also, they as they pile up, they do have these sort of... Um, Slope failure, for, for lack of a better word, when all of a sudden just one part of it will just mass and shift and slide down. All right, so you've got the layering effect from the wind blowing sand over and over again, and then you've got these little settling moments where just big hunks of it slide down. And what that gives you in the rock record is something like that. Now, I've never seen one of these in the wild. Um, this one is fairly big. Um, just looking at the, you know, the tree up on top there. It's hard to tell what's going on at the bottom, but I'm guessing that's a good, uh, you know, two or three. That's probably a 15, 20 foot tree up there. So this is a good size clip. Um, but again, someone, a sedimentologist who, who uh, knows what they're talking about. There's all kinds of different sedimentologists out there. But a sedimentologist that knows what they're talking about can look at this and say, uh, potentially even say, you know, the prevailing winds uh, for however old this is. And every so often I say, you know, about how old something is. Sedimentary rocks are horrible to date. 
um, because they're made up of pieces, parts of so many different things. All right. Um, usually there's a few markers here or there they could look for. Ideally, there's a lava flow or an igneous intrusion because igneous rocks are great for getting dates out of. Um, but sedimentary rocks are tough just because you could you know, take a dozen samples and get a dozen different dates. It'll give you a, a, a bracket, right? No older than, no younger than. Remember principle of inclusion. We talked about that the other day. So he can't tell you when this happened with any exacting detail, but he can re-explain the environment for you just amazingly. So we see the, the different ways the wind blew for, for decades or centuries. We see those shifts I was talking about. So neat stuff. And, and like I said, rather unique signature in the rock record. All right. This one's really subtle. Uh, graded bedding. Not sure what lab we're going to do uh, in the classroom this semester. Um, there's there's one of two. Sometimes we get out these giant six foot tubes, fill them up with water, and dump sand down them. Uh, sometimes we get out these little flower pots and pour water through them. Uh, I'm not sure again which one we're doing. But if we do the giant tube one, you're essentially going to be proving this. And that is the idea that water sorts stuff. All right, we already talked about how wind and flowing water can sort. Remember, we said the faster the wind is blowing or the faster the water is flowing, the bigger stuff it can pick up, right? We talked about that under weathering and erosion. And then as it slows down slowly but surely, it starts dropping sediment. It's going to drop the heaviest stuff first because it's the heaviest thing and it's losing energy, right? all the way down to the leastest thing last. Well, that also works in uh, a still water. If you were just to drop, drop a whole bunch of sediment in, if you have enough distance for the sediment to fall through, it will sort itself out as it's falling through the water. The heaviest stuff falls a little faster, the mediumest stuff, and then the lightest stuff is still frittering around in the water column. So we know that this is a water deposit, but we don't know if it is from a lake or a stream. You'll have to go and look further because, again, the same idea. Remember how we stacked layers at the beginning of the lecture? We had limestone, and then we had shale, and then we had sandstone. All right. Well, this could either be a stream that is dying, sort of running out of water, because where it used to deposit uh, heavier stuff, it's now uh, depositing the medium stuff, and then even later, because remember superposition, all the stuff's on the bottom, right? Younger stuff's on top. So it was depositing uh, coarse grain sand, then medium grain sand, then fine grain sand. Um, that means that stream is, is, is drying up, it's regressing, if you would. Um, or, as I said, it could just be a lake that has had sediment dropped in it for Lord knows how long, and that's just it settling out. So you got to flesh it out a little more. But you can say more than likely that it was an aquatic environment. So graded bedding is just sorting. All right, ripple marks. Ripple marks. Ripple marks are really cool. Um, ripple marks you don't see in the rocks too often. But you could definitely see if you ever pry your eyes off the scenery uh, at eye level on the beach and you look where you're walking, uh, you will definitely see ripple marks all over the place. Um, ripple marks are caused by the water moving in the sediment. And there's two types. Um, and these get missed a lot on the test, I'm guessing, because the words uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical do not show up on here. Um, so you'll want to listen with your good listening ears here. Uh, we have two types of ripple marks, um, symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical are the ones where the uh, wave crests there, you see in the sediment, not the water waves, but the sediment waves. Um, those, those 
peaks or those crests are even. See how it's nice and scalloped, even, 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 the top picks are there. And the bottom, they're all leaning to, well, the right, right? Um, symmetrical ripple marks, the top, are formed from back and forth bi-directional water flow, i.e. waves. Asymmetrical ripple marks, the bottom ones, are from unidirectional, single direction water flow. So not only could you find, if again, if you found this in situ, in location, uh, you found some sandstone, for example, even a mudstone, don't get me wrong, uh, where you see these nice peaked, even ripple marks, you know not only that you were in a body of water, but you were at a body of water that was big enough to make waves. You've got to have a certain size typically to get waves. <coughs> or should you notice that all of the ripple marks are leaning in a particular direction, not only do you know that you were standing in an old stream bed, but you could freaking tell what direction was downhill back then. Because water flows what way? Downhill. So again, th that might seem like really sort of incidental, but when you are looking at something that is 350 million years old, and you could tell what direction was downhill back then, that, that's kind of cool. Um, it, may, it may not be the most helpful bit of information, or it might not seem that way if, if, if you know, sitting here in the classroom. But to be able to piece together stuff like that, it's neat stuff. It's neat stuff. And again, compared with if you actually look through the rest of the rock and find out that it's graded or not, and then you add the ripple marks to it, you could really start to reconstruct these environments. And you're like, okay, what's the point? Well, you guys kind of, they got rid of it. Um, they don't do it so much as they used to. But when I was a kid and you go to the museums, they always had the dioramas behind them, like paintings on the wall to kind of give the, the creatures some context for you. And um, while they weren't exactly making it up, and they were wrong in a lot of cases, which is probably why they got rid of the dioramas, but um, you know they were basing it on a lot of these things, the kind of rocks that the dinosaurs or whatever you're looking at were found in, okay, and um, and fleshing out. Maybe there were some plant fossils around there, so okay, we we see these kind of rocks, we see these kind of plants. It was probably this kind of environment. I'd like to think they were scientific about it, right? Um, and so that went into those those dioramas. Again, that doesn't mean they were 100% on. When I was growing up, they used to think that those uh, brontosaurus, we still call them brontosauruses back then, um, but the apatosaurus, all the big long necks, okay? That there was no possible way that they could, uh, you know, live and sustain themselves on, on land. They were just too big, too massive, so on the stubby little legs, so they always drew them in swamps. They knew they had to eat a massive amount of vegetation. They, they didn't have teeth for meat. They already they figured that out. So they had to have these huge bodies. So they pictured them like hippos, for lack of a better word. And they were just almost constantly in the water. Well, a couple decades later, I'm sure you guys grew up watching Dinosaurs by Disney, okay? And we're drawing herds of them tromping through uh, savannas reaching up like giraffes and picking leaves off the trees. They did a little math, they did a little physics, we found some more critters, things changed. Go back to our very first lecture on the nature of science, right? Um, and, and they're cool with that, we're cool with that. We, we wanna move forward. Does it mean we have to tie down all our old, tear down all our old dioramas? Sure, but that's okay. So all these little details do actually matter for the folks that care, at any rate. Um, and uh, again, if you enjoy going and seeing these things at museums, and hopefully someday you'll bring your kids to museums, well then, then it's worthwhile. Then it's worthwhile. So you've seen that, more than likely. I see them up at Lake Ontario all the time. We try to get up to Lake Ontario at least once or twice a year. Um, 
Uh, Oneida Lake is big enough to get waves. We were there uh, this fall or late this summer. And I was poking around um, at the beach. And you just look down, like I said, ankle deep water really is all you need to be in. And you'll see, see that. Homework for this summer, okay? Tides out here. This is an extreme example. So you can tell you're at a shoreline in this case. Even though those don't look it, they should be symmetrical. There's them in the rock record. Again, going back to our clueless paleontologists. Oh my gosh, there were giant tanks driving across here. Maybe. Maybe. But nope, it's ripple mud. All right, and there's dozens more. I just picked a handful out of your book. Um, rain impressions actually show up. Imagine the same kind of rock or mud as this, but with a whole bunch of dimple marks to look like um, golf ball. All right, rain impressions, and again, they was just lucky enough to get covered over. Um, we mentioned uh, tracks and trails. Uh, oh, fossilized poop, that makes every eight to 12 year old giggle, okay, coprolites. Uh, we find all kinds of fossilized poop out there. Um, nests, oftentimes if we're super lucky, we'll actually find eggs and, and sadly babies in the nest. Um, better just to find hatched eggs, but we find nests and that's how we now know that, you know, dinosaurs, some at any rate, uh, Triceratops was one of the big ones that did it. Um, could you imagine Triceratops sitting on a nest? but uh, that they nested, all right? So all these cool little things that we find in the rock record, um, they all add up, they all add up. So like I said, there's a handful more in your textbook. And um, there is a whole study, you know, and, and, and any one of these topics could almost go off into a, a semester in and of itself if you were uh, going on in geology or even up into grad school with it. You could take 14 weeks, it was carbonate, carbonate uh, sedimentology. Uh, it was all on limestone and reefs and stuff like that. Um, taphonomy is the study of, remember how I was babbling about what could have happened to that fish or what should have happened to that fish? There's a semester class on, on that, taphonomy, the study of uh, burial and decay uh, before fossilization, let alone all the paleontology classes that are out there. Um, sedimentology. So we did this in two lectures and this is you know possibly six, seven, eight different whole entire classes or textbooks. So if it seems like we just kind of lightly touched on this, we, we truly, truly did. Um, where we're going to go next from here, uh, not today, but when we, we come back, uh, will be probably a little bit of geologic time. Um, I have not edited out the geologic time chapter. I'm still kind of new to teaching that in 101. I used to save that for 102, but since 102 hardly ever runs anymore, um, it's important to see a little bit of geologic time. But it has all of those principles of that we talked about the other day. So um, when we get to this uh, lecture, I'll probably slip over a handful of, uh, of the slides and focus on the stuff we haven't talked about, like the radiometric decay. I uh, remember parent element, daughter element, all that fun stuff, half-lives. Um, we'll talk about that. But, uh, but that'll really sort of wrap up this, this uh, conversation that we've had. If you think about it, it all started with weathering and erosion in, in sedimentary rocks. So it's a huge branch of geology. Um, again, it's, it's my branch of geology, so I, I tend to ramble about it, and I, and I keep apologizing, I'm sorry, but, um, but it's, uh, it can be pretty neat stuff. I think way better than deciding, you know, what elements are in that mineral, but that's a personal bias. Maybe you actually dug that, I don't know. So, all right, so that's where we're headed from here. Let me close this up.